Well, thanks, Rick, and thanks to everybody who is here. It's just a great pleasure for me to be here today. I've got all kinds of show and tell items up here, so I will be hauling them out in a minute. But it was also a privilege for me to have a chance to think in a more organized way about place. So I wrote, actually wrote a little talk here, okay? I never write anything but lies, but this is all true. <laughs> Fiction, but, um, but this is all true. First, I just want to say that it's an enormous privilege to be here today on behalf of the nonprofit Southern Environmental Law Center, the largest environmental advocacy organization dedicated to preserving the Southeast natural heritage for future generations. I am a great devotee of Wendell Berry, and one of his remarks that I read recently <coughs> certainly applies to SELC. These are people who are capable of devotion, public devotion to justice. They mean what they say, and every day that passes, they mean it more. And I think this is really true of SELC 25 years after it began. Wendell Berry also said, quite recently, and I wrote this down when he said it, he said, to cherish what remains of the earth and to foster its renewal is our only hope of survival. So that's what you all do, and I am happy and honored to be here with you today. Place is extraordinarily important to most Southern writers, much more so than writers in any other part of the country. This has been true historically, and it's true right now. You never hear about a conference dedicated to Northern literature, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> or Midwestern literature. Why is this? What's going on here? Years ago, I made up my own definition of regional literature, which I do not consider a pejorative term, I have to add, and okay, here it is, this is my definition. Regional literature is literature in which action and characters cannot be moved geographically without major loss or distortion. There is an intimate identification with landscape. Setting is so important that it often defines the lives and possibilities of its characters. It sets the tone or theme of the work, and setting almost becomes a character itself. These criteria are more true in the South than in any other region. Place is the central defining factor, I think, of Southern writing. There's just simply more there, there, I would say, or more here, here, I guess, is, the, uh, is more accurate. Um, just think about it. Let's just take Mississippi alone, okay, for just a minute. We simply cannot imagine William Faulkner's characters existing any place outside his own little, quote, imaginary postage stamp of earth, as he called it. Yachnapatawpha County, Mississippi. Nor could Larry Brown's rawer Mississippi fiction, which was written several decades later and gave rise to the wonderful term grit lit, make, nor could his characters make their hard scrabble livings any place other than his own rough south. <coughs> Eudora Welty's mythic Mississippi offers us another version, as do Elizabeth Spencer's more genteel Delta stories, Walker Percy's quietly despairing existential novels, and Barry Hanna's <coughs> uproarious, darkly comic tales. Clearly, I could go on and on, even you know, about Mississippi, and I can extend my examples to any other state, to Ernest Gaines' Louisiana, for instance or Peter Taylor's Middle Tennessee, or even Peter Taylor's Charlottesville. Think for a minute, can you imagine a Peter Taylor story set in Chicago? <laughs> no, you cannot. <laughs> Nor could Flannery O'Connor 
have sprung forth from any soil other than the mean red dirt of small town Georgia, it seems to me. Even now, in our ever-increasing communication, our age of ever-increasing communication and urbanization with the kind of standardizing created by television and the internet, so that a mall, for instance, in Danville, Virginia, has the exact same stores as a mall in Flint, Michigan, or Anniston, Alabama, or anywhere else, there's still more here, here, in terms of the fine writing, which continues to come out of the sound. Personally, I've always felt, in terms of writing, that the difference never was between North and South anyway, but between an essentially urban culture and an essentially rural culture. That is, between the country the natural world, the small town and the little community versus the built environment, the city and its suburbs and its ubiquitous urban sprawl. Except for the accent, there's not much difference between the rural main <coughs> village of Elizabeth Strout's wonderful book, Olive Kitteridge, for instance, and Wendell Berry's Port Royal, Kentucky, or Alice Monroe's Rural Canada. I mean, it is a mindset. It is a way of seeing the world. It is a kind of storytelling that happens in a human voice, I will say, too. Not abstraction, not, it's not abstract, it's not, it's thematic, it's based on characters, it's based on a certain, there's a certain kind of storytelling. Um, my daddy is quoted up there on that uh, first poster. He, I used to try to get him to leave Grundy and come down and retire to Chapel Hill, but he never retired. He ran his dime store for 55 years and wouldn't leave. He said, honey, I could never leave the mountains. I need me a mountain to rest my eyes against. <laughs> this makes me cry. I do too. I was lucky enough to grow up in the small mining town of Grundy in Buchanan County as far southwest as you can go and still be here in Virginia, where the landscape is pretty much perpendicular. <laughs> I always felt comforted by the ring of mountains which nestle their hand, I mean nestle their town, as an old woman once told me. She said, like a play pretty catched in the hand of God. <laughs> that, right? But I mean the mountains was like being down in a bowl. Um, it was 19 miles over the mountain into West Virginia. 15 miles down the river to Pikeville, Kentucky. Our house sat right on Route 460, the only way in or out of Grundy. <laughs> the Levisa River ran back of the house with the railroad on its other side, carrying Norfolk and Western trains loaded with coal. <coughs> How I loved the mournful whistle of those trains as they roared past several times a day. I stood there on the riverbank every time we'd run out when the train was coming. I stood there on the riverbank watching them pass, wondering where they were going. We didn't go anywhere much. We ran the mountains like little animals, me and my cousins and all the other kids in Cowtown, as our stretch of Route 460 was called enjoying a kind of freedom which would be hard to imagine today. Climbing trees and cliffs, playing in caves, swinging on grapevines, catching salamanders, damming up the creek, building lean-tos and lookouts, playing Indians and settlers with their handmade slingshots and the occasional Christmas bow and arrow set. Every day after school we'd throw down our books and literally head for the hills. We'd stay there until they rang the big bell to call us home. Once back in my own front yard, I spent a lot of time there sitting under a giant cluster of forsythia bushes, which I called the dog bushes because I had an endless series of family pets under there with me. <laughs> <laughs> my um, Pekingese Misty and our boxer Queenie come to mind along with an entire town full of imaginary friends. I was an only child. <laughs> so I had a lot of imaginary friends. My two best friends in the Dogbush town were named Sylvia 
and Vaini. Name for my favorite food, the Vaini sausage. <laughs> <laughs> those wonderful little pans that I used to take under there with me to eat for lunch, along with those little cellophane packets of saltine crackers. My friend, my best friend, Vaini, was beautiful, with long, red, curly hair. I was not supposed to swim in the Levisa River, which ran black behind their house, because they were often washing coal in it upstream. But I spent hours on the riverbank. Now I'm going to read a little section from my first novel. This is it. Uh, it's written from the point of view of a nine-year-old child, and it is called The Last Day of the Dog Bushes Blend. So here's, and this is about the kind of thing uh, a weird little only child such as myself would do with her time. Um, so this is going to the waiting, to going down to the river, okay, to the waiting house. And she's nine years old. The weight of the waiting house was hard. That's what was so good about it. After I got there, no scouts could track me down. First, I went out from under the other side of the dog bushes, the side away from my yard and under the fence. Then I went by a secret path through the blackberry bushes, which tried to grab me as I went past. They reached out their hands at me, but I got away. When I came to the river bank, I walked through the water to the waiting house. That way, if anybody tracked me with dogs, they would lose the trail. <laughs> the waiting house was not a real house. It was a soft, light green tree, a willow that grew by the bank. The way the branches came down, they made a little house inside them. The land and the tiny river were both inside the house, and it was the only waiting house in the world and I was the only one that knew about it. It was a very special place. There were a lot of other people who lived there too, and they were my good friends. There was a young lizard named Jerry, because I didn't know if it was a boy or girl, and Jerry's can go either way. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry had a long, shiny tail, and he stayed mostly in the weeds, but he would come out to say hello to me every time I came. A very wise old grandfather turtle lived there too. He blinked his eyes slow at me, and I could tell that he knew everything there was to know. <laughs> grandfather turtle had three silly daughters, but I liked them because they were cute. Let's see. Uh, their shelves were like the rug in the living room of Sarah Dale's house, brown and green by turns. The big rock by the side of the river was not a rock at all. It was a secret apartment house. A baby black snake sat on the top. He was so black and fast that it hurt you to look at him. On the second floor, the sides of the rock, there lived a big family of little brown bugs. They were always busy and never had much time to play. The worms did, though. They lived on the ground floor under the rock, and I liked them best of all. I never knew a family that had so much fun. All they did was wiggle and laugh. <laughs> After I said hi to everybody in the waiting house, I liked to sit under the big tree on the bank and think about a lot of things. There were a lot of things to think about then, and there was nothing to keep from thinking about like there is now. Or sometimes I would sit like that day and look at everything very hard so it would stay in my head for always. Is such a childhood still possible? Well, yes it is. Now I want to introduce you to my own student with the wonderful name Silas House. A lot of you have read his work too, I think. And I want to introduce you to my own student Silas House from Lily, Kentucky. And I want to read you a scene from his fourth novel, just released, entitled Eli the Good, um, which I think ought to be required reading in every high school in America. Not only is it a hymn to trees, literally, but in Silas's own words, it's also a depiction of the way war will live on in people long after it's over. So I brought this to show you. This is just out. Um, Eli the Good, 
which has been adopted as required reading in New York City public middle schools, which I think is really interesting. So um, let me just read you a little bit from Eli the Good, okay? And this is a boy speaking. I went to my beech tree on the ridge overlooking our house. Nobody knew I had this secret place of my own, not even eating. After a while, I leaned my head against the beach and let its coolness sink into my forehead. When I did this, I didn't have to think about anything at all. I just let the calm that the tree always possessed spread through me. And for a brief time, I had no thoughts of my father killing a man or of a war I didn't understand or of anything else. Above me, there were all the birds calling to one another. But beyond them, there were hundreds of birds who sat silently, watching, waiting, and most likely dozens of snakes and lizards and other animals who were aware of me without my having any knowledge of them. I imagine that farther up the ridge, where the outcropping of gray rocks stood like rows of clumped, crooked gravestones, a fox was watching me. I was so sure that I was being observed that I closed my eyes, picturing him. I thought he was a little child fox, and I could see each of his fine whiskers on either side of his nose, his brown eyes that had a spot of yellow in each one. His orange coat was clean and shiny. The white that smudged around his face lay like a soft shield on his chest. I imagined that he was considering me, wondering why I looked so sad. The little fox may or may not have been there. I like to think that he was, and that after a long while he slinked away, wishing that we lived in the kind of world where he could comfort me. After a time, I turned and sat down, my back resting against the beach, my knees drawn up to my chest. Sometimes, just being still is the best thing you can do for yourself. <laughs> but things are changed. So that's another Appalachian childhood here, a much more recent one. But things are changing in Appalachia <coughs> fast. Now, the real Grundy of my childhood has completely vanished, victim of continued flooding due to irresponsible land uses and mining <coughs> practices swept away by the swiftly rising runoff from those vertical mountains that I love. A creative alliance of government agencies and the town itself is building a new, quote, new Grundy on higher ground across the river, but it's still a work in progress. And the young Silas House has grown up to become a leading activist with Kentuckians for the Commonwealth, working against mountaintop removal mining. In addition to Eli the Good, he's also published this book, um, Something's Rising, an oral history of Appalachians fighting mountaintop removal mining, which I wrote the introduction to. Um, and I want you to listen for just a second and contrast the idyllic visions of Appalachian childhood you just, we just read with Judy Bond's account in this book, her oral history of taking her grandson out to play in the creek behind her house where he found, quote, this white gooey stuff in the bottom, polyacrylamide. It's absorbed through the skin. It causes burns on the inside of your body. It causes cancer. They all use polyacrylamide at the preparation plants. Judy also tells us that, quote, the kids here are sleeping fully clothed at night plotting out escape routes, just waiting for the next Buffalo Creek. To my mind, this mountaintop removal mining practice is a, is a national emergency, and there's a way in which I feel that we all live downstream. SELC is hard at work in Appalachia, as it is all over the southeastern United States, working to ensure that strong and effective laws and policies are in place and enforced to protect our health and our environment. Right now, SELC is taking action in multiple ways to try to stop mountaintop removal mining in Virginia and Tennessee. Lots of groups are involved in this fight, 
but SELC has the unique advantage of having the resources to actually take on the challenge of weaning the South from coal as a primary energy source for electricity. SELC's 2008 victory in the U.S. Supreme Court is closing right now the largest cleanup of existing old dirty power plants in history. And they're also knocking out new proposed coal-fired power plants left and right. This means mount less mountaintop removal mining, less air pollution, and less global warming emissions. Remember what my daddy said about needing a mountain to rest his eyes against? This year, SELC was instrumental in the passage of the Virginia Ridge and Valley Act, historic legislation passed by Congress which permanently protects 53,000 acres of national forest land in the Jefferson National Forest. These are mountains in southwest Virginia, very close to Grundy. So wherever you are from, wherever you live in the South, SELC is doing something to protect the land and the environment you love too. We have to do this for our children and our grandchildren and for all future writers to come. I wonder, will any of them associate the word Twitter with bird song? <laughs> <laughs> or only with their cell phones? So many young people today are already geared to a screen and to the changing electronic image. I would like to see them turn off these machines and go out into the woods and spend time in silence in nature. I think there's nothing like it, but we're losing it. And we're losing the capacity for a certain kind of thought. We need to get young people to slow down and listen and look but we have to make sure there's something for them to look at and listen to, don't we? We could not have become the writers we have been without it, without the Twitter of birds, without the running creek, without the wading houses and special trees, without the wild places. Listen to what Barbara Kingsolver has to say about it. Quote, a world is looking over my shoulder as I write these words. My sensors are bobcats and mountains. I have places from which I tell my stories. So do you, I expect. We sing the song of our home because we are animals. And an animal is no better or wiser or safer than its habitat and its food chain. Among the greatest of all gifts is to know our place. I write about people, but I'm a writer who grew up among trees. My stories explore that mystery, the intimate relation of human passion and human place. I'm a writer so tied to place that I cannot even imagine a story. I can't begin to write a story, a novel, or anything without drawing a map of it first. For instance, uh, this is a novel I wrote, Oral History, and first I had to draw this map. There's a funny story about this, because what I did is I took all my favorite place names from Buchanan County, but I put them anywhere I wanted them. <laughs> How about that? See, I just put them where I felt like. And uh, Hoodow Holler, Hoodow Mountain, Hurricane Mountain, Black Rock Mountain, all the Grassy Creek, all these places. Well then, um, American uh, Playhouse was gonna come and shoot a four-part mini-series, which fell through, unfortunately, but they were gonna come and shoot this television series in Grundy. And so they set up um, an office right downtown, and everybody was down there, you know, <laughs> hoping to get a role in the film. And then they were, you know, they were doing locations, and so they hired my cousin Fletcher Dennis to drive him around in his truck to find locations. And Fletcher called me up from the truck, and he said, "Honey," he said, "I don't know." He said, "You might be able to write a novel, but you sure as hell don't know how to draw a map." <laughs> That, that did fall through, and we never did get the four-part miniseries. This PBS American Playhouse was who it was. Um, however, as I said, I, I am a um, writer so tied to place that I can't imagine a story without the map of it. Uh, this novel, Oral History, covers three generations, but it starts 
with the return of a man named <coughs> Almarine Cantrell from prison to his ancestral cabin in the Hoodown Holler. And I'll just read this one little paragraph and we'll almost be done here. This is, he's just gotten back to the mountains. And he's, you know, he's in his cabin and he's looking out. And this is an old woman, an old granny woman named Granny Younger who's talking to us. Anyway, here's Almarine. A looking out the door of his cabin where the creek goes down the holler and down and down again in front of the cabin until a turkey tails out in the bottom and runs along flat down there so far you can't hardly see it. Beyond that stand of sycamores where it flows on through the spruce, sprucey pines and from there down the Mitten House branch and into the dismal river at Tug where the courthouse is. And if he looks to the left on past it, he sees all the furthest ranges line on line, purple and blue and blue again and smoky, till you can't tell the mountains apart from the sky. Lord, it'll make a man think something, seeing that. It'll make a man think deep. Mountains have always encouraged lofty thoughts, as the psalmist reminds us. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. Or my hope, I would add, or my inspiration, or my aspiration, or my dreams, or my stories. Purple and blue and blue again and smoky till you can't tell the mountains apart from the sky. Such a view will make any man or woman or child think deep. Let it make us work hard as well. Thank you.